Thank you for joining the Fire Suppression Systems Association webinar on fire protection for hot and cold aisle containment systems in data centers. Your phone lines have been muted. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the question box on the bottom right-hand side of your webinar control box, and we will take them throughout the, throughout the presentation and at the end of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to download after the presentation is over. With us today, we have our webinar chair, Todd Stevens with Canistraro, and our presenter, Lee Kaiser with Ore Protection Systems. I'll now turn the mic over to Todd. Thank you, Becca. Hello, and welcome to another great installment of the Fire Suppression Systems Association webinar series. Thank you to all in attendance today. Just one quick announcement before we begin. I wanted to mention that the FSSA annual forum is being held on February 28th through March 4th of next year at the Hammock Beach Resort, Palm Coast, Florida. Note that the hotel block is getting close to full, so if you haven't made your hotel reservations, I would suggest that you do it um, soon. The program committee is working very hard to make this annual forum one of the best ever, so you won't want to miss it. So today's topic, today's webinar, as Becca mentioned, is fire protection for hot and cold aisle containment systems in data centers. Our presenter is Mr. Lee Kaiser. Lee is the Vice President of Engineering, Business Applications, and Training for Ore Protection Systems. Ore is a fire protection contractor focusing on mission critical facilities. Lee is a professional in both fire protection and mechanical engineering with licensing in several states. He leads the system design, business software, and technical training functions for ore protection. He is the chairman of NFPA Technical Committee on Electric Computer Systems, NFPA 75, and is on both FSSA's Technical Committee and Board of Directors. And he is also frequent, a frequent speaker and presenter for seminars, workshops, and conferences across the country. We're thrilled to have such a great presenter with us today. And with that said, I want to turn it over to Lee. Sorry for the slight delay, everyone, but Lee's uh, presentation is popping up now, if you just bear with us for a moment, and uh, Lee will be getting going. Todd, can you confirm that you can see the screen? We can see the first slide and we can hear you. Great. You're all set, Lee. Thank you. All right. So um, let's minimize it. Okay. Now we can get going. Um, okay. So thanks, Todd, for the introduction and uh, appreciate you all putting up with. Uh, uh, technology for a moment. Um, uh, as we discussed, we're going to talk about uh, data center fire protection with regards to hot and cold aisle containment systems. Um, and so why this is important is because 
data centers are a fairly large user of many of the gaseous fire suppression systems that the Fire Suppression Systems Association represents. And um, two things really kind of rule the data center space, and that's power to uh, the, the computer servers and, and IT hardware as part of that, and the cooling, the, the HVAC cooling that's required to cool those down. A lot of the things we do in a data center is to deliver power and cooler pro cooling properly so the IT function in a data center can be handled. And so what's changing there is the amount of power that a data center consumes is going up. And we see that in higher rack densities of power. So a rack is, is a large cabinet that contains many uh, computers. And as we pack more and more computer power, computing power into a rack, that the, um, the amount of power per rack is going up it has been going up for several years and now we're seeing some very high um, uh, consumptions on average now uh, we're seeing consumptions of around 14 kW per rack uh, is sort of a, a high-end rack up to 30 uh, kilowatts of power per rack so um, high densities, whereas a few years ago, a six uh, kilowatt rack was what we were used to seeing in data centers. Uh, to cool all that, all, all that power generates heat. And to cool that down, there are new strategies for air handling uh, in data centers. And that's what's really, it's ultimately that new cooling strategy that's in place in many facilities that is challenging the performance of our fire protection systems. So when we, we look at a data center, we often talk about the layout of the racks and uh, this, this used to be um, not common. Now it's, it's very common to have a hot aisle, cold aisle arrangement. And so when you look at a rack, like the, the, in this picture, there are six rows of, of data racks. There's a hot face to the data rack and a cold face to the, the data rack. The cold face is where we want to deliver cooling air to, uh, to the computers and the hot side of the rack is where that hot air is rejected. And so many data centers nowadays have um, two hot faces facing each other, which creates a hot aisle and then the, the remaining cold faces facing each other for the cold aisle. So that hot aisle, cold aisle arrangement is important because then we can use that to our advantage for cooling the equipment. Uh, and so the traditional approach for cooling data center equipment was to um, uh, deliver cold air at the, the cold faces of our aisles and then allow that air to be exhausted to the, the hot side of the rack and then that air go back to the uh, cooling unit, the uh, the crack unit, or a computer room air conditioning unit, or some you know sometimes even if you know a brand name, you hear them call them the Liebert units in the unit or in the in the data center. Um, and that strategy can only take us so far with regards to rack density. Once we exceed six kilowatts per rack, then that doesn't provide adequate cooling to the data center. So a new strategy was needed to um, uh, be developed and that is uh, hot aisle, cold aisle containment systems. And so in this strategy, we add new devices into the data center to help contain the air to directionally route the air to cool the equipment and separate hot air from cold air. Uh, without aisle containment, we get a phenomenon called hot air bypass. And as the um, as the cooling uh, airflow increases, sometimes uh, hot air will come from the hot aisle and short circuit back to the front side of the cold aisle. Uh, and then essentially when you've got a lot of hot air bypass happening in your data center, the servers or the IT equipment at the top of your racks will be the ones that tend to overheat. And when IT equipment overheats, 
the safety is built into it, it automatically shuts down a lot of that equipment. And so you can have uh, unwanted uh, uh, stoppage of that IT equipment. And so that's what we're trying to avoid with aisle containment. And so um, there, uh, in, a, in a normal, or I guess in a modern data center where aisle containment is deployed, um, there are two strategies. There's cold aisle containment systems where we build a box around the cold aisle. So a lot of times we place a roof inside of uh, our room. And then there's hot aisle containment where we, we duct the hot air um, uh, to a plenum or to a duct and then back to uh, the cooling units for the data center. So let's take a little bit of a closer look at those. Uh, cold aisle containment designs still often use raised floor systems. Uh, another trend we're seeing is uh, less data centers being uh, um, built with raised floor, but uh, sometimes that in, in a cold aisle containment system, the cold air will be ducted right into the cold aisle and will still contain that. And so that air is forced through the server equipment and and out the hot side of the uh, um, uh, out into the room from the hot side of the server racks and then that air makes its way across the ceiling back to the cooling units at the perimeter or maybe even in another room one uh, sort of change to that or, or variant is a better way to say it is uh, hot air collars where instead of uh, you, you know the whole room is our cold aisle where we're providing that that cooling air and then we actually duct using chimneys straight up to the ceiling or to a duct going back to the cooling units uh, using these collars so that's one variant of cold aisle containment hot aisle containment um, is where we build a large duct or a uh, a large collar around the entire hot aisle and allow that hot air um, to be separated now from the cold air and it goes up. One thing that you'll notice between a hot aisle containment data center and a cold aisle containment data center is the hot aisle containment data centers are more comfortable when you walk into them because you're amongst the cooling air. Um, hot, cold aisle containment, we contain the cold air so you're actually in the hot aisle outside of the space. So they're much uh, warmer uh, to walk into, which frankly, just a lot of people don't like. Um, uh, and, and so that, that warm air coming out of the uh, hot aisle containment device goes up into a ceiling plenum quite frequently, or again, maybe just directly ducted back to the cooling units. What you'll often see in a data center that's deploying this is uh, if it's an existing data center, there will be a project to extend the returns from the the crack units around the perimeter of the room up to the ceiling and that may impact some things for suppression systems with regard to how the pipes ran so there may need, need to be some piping modifications to deal with those extensions um, up up to the ceiling space uh, again a variant to highlight in this case is uh, in row cooling there are some data centers that use close coupled in row coolers um, uh, to cool the air immediately around the pod that is built with containment. And so it sucks air out of the hot aisle, cools it down in a unit that's sitting directly adjacent to one of the racks or amongst a row of racks and then blows cold air, which can be sucked back into the hot aisle again in a continuous loop. So that's a, again, a variant of hot aisle containment. Now, the, the products or the materials to which we build containment systems, uh, you know, the sky's the limit. A lot of uh, creative companies have used different materials. Sometimes we, we look at fixed infrastructure systems that use a lot of plexiglass and aluminum framing to build, um, uh, build the, the partitions such as the picture on uh, the left. Um, and then, uh, you know, also used a lot are plastic strip curtains or uh, continuous plastic curtains. And those are attached to the ceiling and they um, are fairly low cost 
to uh, in order to build containment and some separation of that warm air and the cold air in the space. And so you'll see both out there in data centers. Um, uh, and then when the the containment is applied, there's a lot of variance in that. Sometimes it's included as part of the initial design of a new data center build out. Uh, a lot of times in existing data centers, as the computing load has increased, they've realized the need for aisle containment to improve their cooling efficiency. So it'll be retrofitted into uh, the data center. And it's, you know, it's often modified over the life of the data center. And, and the, the key thing for fire suppression uh, uh, professionals is they need to realize that it's the cooling and power needs that are driving this change and we need to be there to help remind them that the fire suppression system needs to be adjusted uh, to accommodate their new cooling strategy. And so we've got to be creative in our ability to do that. Uh, and so as we talk about fire protection here in the data center, there are three main systems that get affected by aisle containment systems uh, as they're applied to the data center. Uh, of course, smoke detection often used in data centers so we can have early warning of a fire it can be affected by aisle containment. Uh, the sprinkler system, whether it's pre-action or wet, uh, will be affected by the partitions uh, installed for the containment system and the gaseous clean agent system, if one's there, that can also be affected. And so we're gonna talk about, uh, as we dive in further here, some of the challenges to those systems when aisle containment systems are installed. So there's five fire protection challenges and, and let's start with those obstructions. The obstructions as they get, um, I, here's the way I look at it. The containment system is really building a partition or uh, a partition to separate the hot air from the cold air, whether it's hot aisle, containment or cold aisle containment, there's a new partition in the space. That partition is an obstruction to our fire protection systems and their performance. So those obstructions can impact the sprinkler spray patterns in the space, can impact the smoke detection coverage and spacing, and they can also impact the clean agent system nozzle clearances and the coverages of those nozzles. So we, we need to be aware that that's a challenge. Uh, for sprinkler spray patterns, um, uh, understand that if a partition uh, is put too close to a sprinkler, it can impact the spray pattern. So NFPA 13 gives us requirements. NFPA 13, of course, being the uh, standard for the installation of sprinkler systems, gives us requirements in uh, uh, chapter nine for uh, uh, obstructions. And so we need to make sure that those obstructions either don't uh, cause a spray pattern, pattern problem or we need to adjust the location of the sprinklers. And I would suggest that we'd be more willing to adjust the uh, sprinkler location than to tell the data center operator that they can't have a partition to provide proper cooling for their equipment. Um, uh, it can impact clean agent nozzles. So uh, many manufacturers offer typical uh, or, or offer sizing guidelines for how big of an area, how big of a coverage rectangle a nozzle can cover. So in big data centers where we would have a typical rule of thumb 40 foot by 40 foot coverage rectangle from a single nozzle, if we install, um, as I animate the slide here, uh, aisle containment partitions, they, that may break up the coverage rectangles. And so we may need to adjust or add nozzles to accommodate uh, those partitions in the space. Uh, another thing with clean agent systems is uh, the, the gaseous agent as it comes out of the nozzles for halocarbon based systems and, and the, the ketones, it's usually a two phase flow uh, fluid. So it's um, uh, a combination of both gas and liquid coming out of the nozzle and it takes a few feet usually four to feet four to six feet of clearance for that agent to vaporize and fully become a gas if in ex an existing data center an aisle containment partition is installed next to a nozzle um, it may be installed so close that that 
coverage or that that uh, clearance requirement cannot be met and so you run the risk of a phenomenon phenomenon called frosting some people call it splashing where that liquid agent that's coming out of the nozzle um, hits that surface and takes a longer time to convert to a gas so that could impact the time to build an extinguishing concentration in that space. Um, challenge two is inadequate obstruction removal. Understand that many of these obstructions or partitions for our containment are intended to uh, automatically remove themselves. Uh, and so those can, again, impact the sprinkler spray patterns, um, uh, the clean agent nozzle clearances, and, and the concentration development if those are not removed adequately. Now, one of the early on things with aisle containment that was um, a real challenge to fire protection, and, and lots of data centers still exist like this today, was the, the uh, plastic strip curtains that were being used for containment were installed on rails, aluminum rails, and those rails were attached to the ceiling grid using uh, thermal fusible links. And so uh, this is uh, some, you know, on the slide, you can read some of this language, which ultimately came from some manufacturer's literature, but their names have been removed to uh, protect the guilty. The hardware is designed so that the curtains fall away in the case of a fire allowing sprinklers full operating range. And, and the, the other quote, should an event occur that would set off a water sprinkler system, the UL listed fusible links will melt, will fall, will melt and will fall harmlessly away from the ceiling down to the floor. So that's, that's really the misnomer is that, yes, they are UL listed links, but just in this, this application, it can be a real problem. So uh, think about, will those fusible links actually allow that curtain to fall away? Um, in this picture here, imagine a fire inside of or next to an aisle containment or a, a contained aisleway. Uh, all of those fusible links would have to receive enough heat for them to fall away. Imagine if the sprinklers were outside of that contain, contained aisleway and the fire was inside, Think about how big that fire would have to be before all the fusible links melted and the first sprinkler was able to receive enough heat to operate. So that's the major problem with the fusible link based systems and in practical reality, they're not going to help uh, improve the performance of uh, the fire, the fire sprinklers and they're, they're really going to cause the fire to be larger than it needed to be in the data center uh, and delay the sprinklers from operating and acting upon that fire to control its growth. Um, uh, and, and then the with clean agent systems, we activate those systems off of smoke detection. So when those, those barriers are not removed from heat because we're gonna activate when the fire is small, when we can just sense smoke, um, those barriers will still be in place and that will impact the distribution of the, the, the gaseous clean agent into that space. Uh, another challenge that gets created by aisle containment is that we, we basically build um, multiple volumes inside of the space. And so as we separate the larger volume into smaller volumes, that can impact the clean agent concentration development the smoke detection coverage, and then our, our strategy for releasing the clean agents when we use cross zoning or other confirming detection techniques such as counting zone sequences. Um, uh, another question is, will that agent concentration development with develop within the area of containment? So if we've built a smaller volume inside the space, uh, NFPA require, NFPA 2001, the standard for clean agent fire extinguishing systems requires that each volume inside the protected space have uh, detectors, piping, and nozzles. So now we're creating new volumes in the space that may not have detectors, piping, and nozzles. Uh, and which, you know, uh, today we do not have the data of whether or not that gas will get into that space without having 
nozzles inside of it, let alone detectors. If a fire uh, starts inside that contained pod, will we get detection fast enough to activate the system and keep the fire as small as possible? Um, uh, with, with smoke detection, um, uh, what I mentioned before, cross zoning, uh, another phrase, uh, another term is counting zoning. For cross zoning, we use that with conventional fire alarm or fire suppression control panels where we have two zones of detection and it takes one detector on each zone to activate before we will release the clean agent system into the space. And so when we add aisle containment, we can separate those detectors and it can take a longer time for smoke to get to detectors on both circuits. So we can have first detection, second detection, and then release. For addressable fire alarm systems, we don't, uh, we, we, we use some, a technique called counting zone. So it takes two detectors still, uh, first detector comes in as one first detection, second detector comes in as second detection, that again, it can slow down getting those two detectors to activate the system. So um, uh, uh, the, you know, the smaller compartments that we build with IL containment can impact detection and potentially slow the release of the gaseous suppression system. Um, another challenge that IL containment creates as we separate the cold air from the hot air um, and, and now there's no mixing, we can exceed temperatures that fire protection equipment is rated for. In the hot aisles, uh, high temperatures uh, uh, can impact the, the sprinkler temperature rating, the smoke detector, detector temperature rating, and even uh, may require some uh, clean agent concentration adjustments. And finally, high airflow velocities. This really speaks to how uh, aisle containment affects smoke detection in these spaces. Um, uh, because we're moving more air and we're better able to cool the IT equipment, the air, the air change rate may increase, which increases the velocity of uh, the, the air inside the contain aisleway, which um, will affect the smoke uh, detection performance in the way that the smoke moves, and it will also affect the clean agent dispersion in the space as now we have new airflow patterns that we weren't uh, originally anticipating uh, where we have data centers that get modified for aisle containment systems. Now, the good news is that uh, in NFPA 75, that's the standard for protection of information technology equipment. That is a occupancy specific uh, standard for data centers, um, there is new information on how to deal with aisle containment. Now, what we're gonna talk about in NFPA 75 is mirrored in NFPA 76. That's the standard for the protection of telecommunications facilities. So uh, 75 uh, data centers, 76 telecom facilities, they, they, we, we really see the same things happening from an aisle containment perspective. And so the, the requirements are the same in both documents. And in the 2013 edition of NFPA 75, this was addressed. So if you were, you know, saw it back then, this is review, but the, the information lives on in today's 2017 standard for our uh, 2017 edition of NFPA 75. And so a new section was added, uh, uh, which, which addresses these challenges with eight new requirements. And let's go through those. So requirement number one is that aisle containment um, uh, partitions are constructed with fire retardant materials. Those materials need to have a flame spread index of less than 50 and a smoke development uh, uh, index of less than 450. Um, uh, and so ultimately now the NFP 75 and 76 limits the materials that can be used in there as the materials that can be used in your aisle containment system have to meet these flame and smoke spread ratings, which you will know if you uh, understand much about plenum rated materials, these are less stringent than what uh, can be provided in a plenum and be plenum rated. 
Um, uh, speaking of plenums, uh, point number two in NFPA 75 is that IL containment systems are not classified as plenums. The volumes in the room as we break them down uh, do not uh, are, shouldn't be considered by a fire marshal or other authority having jurisdiction as a plenum space. And the code reads 6.74, IL containment systems and hot air collars shall not be considered to be plenum. So that's that's one of those call off the dog, uh, the dogs sections there where we, we um, are telling AHJs that this is not a plenum, so not all materials in here need to be plenum rated. Um, but they do, you know, refer to point one where I need to, uh, the aisle containment uh, materials, again, need to meet certain flame and smoke spread rating requirements. Uh, point number three in NFPA 75 is that uh, equipment needs to be rated for the temperature maximum of hot aisles. And so understand as data centers are trying to become more energy efficient, and use less energy to operate them to get the same amount of IT computing power, they are increasing the temperatures that are allowed in uh, in the data center. In fact, it used to be when you walked into a data center, you'd need to you know wear a coat because a lot of people would you know use the old phrase, you could hang hang meat in this place. Uh, yeah, data centers were cold places, and that's how data center operators wanted them. They wanted them to be cold, but now as we've gotten more sophisticated in data center operation, we are increasing the inlet air temperature, meaning the cold air temperature coming into the face of the servers, which is correspondingly increasing the hot air temperature. And so uh, we, we see many hot aisles operating at around 120 degrees Fahrenheit. But if the HVAC would fail, and the IT equipment would continue to operate, we are seeing uh, buildups within a couple minutes of uh, hot aisle temperatures up to 150 degrees. Now understand this really affects smoke detectors and sprinklers. The maximum operating temperature of most commercially available photoelectric spot smoke detectors is 120 degrees Fahrenheit. We can exceed that. That means that the, the detector may not operate to see a fire and understand as the temperature, the surface temperatures increase, the the likelihood for ignition also goes up. So that's maybe where we see our fire in the data center. And then for sprinklers, consider that the temperature selection of the sprinklers. So if we can hit 150 degrees, we don't want to have a normal, uh, uh, ordinary temp, uh, a quick response sprinkler rated for 135 degrees inside of our hot aisle. We may cause an accidental sprinkler discharge if that's the case, if we, we get that hot of a temperature in the hot aisle. So we need to maybe think about uh, uh, going up in our temperature selection for sprinklers. Um, uh, for retrofitting aisle containment, there is a requirement that reads 6.77 where aisle containment systems are installed, the existing suppression and detection systems shall be evaluated, modified, and tested as necessary to maintain compliance with the applicable codes and standards. So ultimately, that's a, a that's a comment in there that we may need to go back and retroactively uh, adjust the fire protection systems to deal with the new aisle containment systems that are in place in the data center. Uh, point five uh, is for sprinkler systems. Uh, and so we'll, we'll, we'll touch on some sprinkler things and then some suppression things as we move, to, move towards our eighth requirement. Uh, the fifth requirement, sprinkler systems, we need to address obstructions. So uh, with those new obstructions that get installed as part of the, uh, the aisle containment system, we need to follow NFPA 13 requirements and modify the sprinkler system as necessary. That's now called for. Also, uh, for automatic obstruction removal, meaning automatic removal of the aisle containment system, it's allowed for, okay, but only if it's removed via smoke detection. So we need to have a electronic device that helps um, remove the system once the smoke detectors in the space see that there's smoke before the sprinklers operate. And then the releasing devices to remove the obstruction must be listed for that purpose. And 
all the obstructions in the entire suppression zone in the entire sprinkler zone or room need to be removed so it's not just removing the closest ones we need to do the whole room at once and the removal as the 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 obstruction material falls away it can't impact the egress and we and the the code refers to nfpa 101 the life safety code so if your curtains after they're automatically removed wind up falling on the floor and that's impeding a person's ability to egress the space that's that's a problem and then the removal can't lower the intended level of protection that's the last thing that's written into the code that um, if uh, you know the aisle containment uh, you know materials fall away and they actually add fuel um, or, or combustibles to the fire that started that's that's a problem also so these need to be uh, thought through at if there's going to be automatic obstruction removal and and understand before I leave that slide automatic obstruction removal is one way that the sprinkler system would not need to be modified for those obstructions so we would we would want to remove the obstructions via smoke detection and then allow the existing sprinkler spacing in the data center to to remain and uh, uh, not impact the sprinkler spray pattern so that's sort of a trade-off requirement that some um, uh, some data centers are choosing now for gaseous systems point seven is that uh, the code says that um, gaseous suppression systems where present uh, uh, they need to produce the required design concentration throughout the entire volume served including the sub volumes uh, for the contained aisleways and, and you need to modify the suppression system as necessary to account for the aisle containment system uh, point eight is uh, again uh, where there's gaseous systems for automatic obstruction removal. Again, the same points before. Remove the, the obstructions via smoke detection. The releasing device, the, yeah, the, the partition releasing devices are listed for the purpose. Has to be done prior to the agent discharge. Have to remove the entire zone. Can impact egress and it can't lower the level of fire protection. So one of the questions that's still out there in the minds of many uh, suppression experts is gaseous systems we know penetrate uh, many uh, shielded enclosures and data center uh, racks to be able to get into the rack and address fires that's why we don't have to put nozzles right in the rack so we anticipate that uh, some of that gas will flow through those racks into the contained sub volume but we don't really have proof of that. So we wanna let the, you know, the viewers of this webinar know that in 2019, the Fire Suppression Systems Association is partnering with the Fire Industry Association in Europe, the FIA, to conduct testing on clean agent uh, distribution. And that research will include uh, trying to determine uh, the, the characteristics of agent dispersion during air higher flow conditions um, uh, when aisle containment is is present with uh, without nozzles uh, well um, gas flow through the the equipment into the contained aisleway and this will be done in an operating data center so this research project is uh, in its planning stages um, uh, there are a number of manufacturers uh, at that are going to be present and uh, contributing to the testing. Um, and then uh, the FSSA has been able to acquire a facility uh, that's built as a data center to do this testing. And the, the hopes is that the testing will answer whether or not automatic obstruction removal is required for gaseous systems. We are sure from a practical standpoint, it will still be required for sprinkler systems but if there is a gaseous system in play, will those obstructions need to be removed or will the gas flow through the equipment and build concentration in the contained aisleway? So um, uh, just look forward to more communications from the FSSA on the results of that testing. And then ultimately, 
uh, depending on uh, what is learned, I'm sure some of that information will be uh, uh, make its way into NFPA 75 and 76 and maybe NFPA 2001 um, uh, on that new research and what's learned from, from those tests. Now, uh, but I would be remiss if I didn't speak a little bit about smoke detection uh, a bit further as we talk about IL containment. Um, uh, the the, the uh, NFPA 72, the National Fire Alarm and Signaling Code, guides us in doing uh, applying smoke detection to data centers. Um, there is a table that you may be familiar, familiar with um, that has uh, it, the air change rates in it and the adjustments to the spacing per detector. Um, many data centers are being built today with air change rates higher than what are covered by the table. And so uh, there was a, a Fire Protection Research Foundation project that looked into and investigated smoke, uh, smoke movement and smoke detection in high airflow uh, spaces, including data centers. And from that, there was uh, that research made its way into uh, NFPA 75 uh, as new guidance for uh, smoke detection. And so the new uh, NFP 75, the 2017 edition has that information. And it says now that smoke detection for, for early warning fire detection, smoke detection is required at the ceiling level throughout the information technology equipment area, so the data center, uh, below raised floors that contain cables um, any cables, we need to have detection in the raised floor space, in the exhaust or return air stream where aisle containment systems are used. So if we have um, aisle containment, specifically hot aisle containment, we need to have uh, detection in that area. And in the return air stream where the above ceiling area is used as a return air plenum. So if we're not ducting our hot air back to our uh, uh, cooling units, then we need to have, and we're using the the return air or the uh, ceiling plenum as our return air plenum. Then we need to have detection in there, and then finally we need to have detection located to operate any smoke dampers that are required above suspended ceilings or below raised floors, if those dampers are part of ductwork used to circulate air to other parts of the building or where suppression systems may be, be deployed. So those are the new requirements for uh, uh, fire, early warning fire detection in data centers. Now, just to show you that graphically, <clears throat> I have two slides just on some of the, the suggested locations. Um, uh, for uh, hot aisle containment systems, these green dots are places that we, uh, that the code basically recommends detection to be at. Um, uh, at the ceiling uh, for general area detection in the in the um, uh, ceiling plenum, uh, at the return air unit and in the subfloor and also finally in the hot aisle containment area. Uh, for cold aisle containment, this, these are the locations uh, uh, suggested uh, at the ceiling, at the return air to the unit, in the subfloor, and uh, and then potentially at the server cabinet on the hot the hot face of the cabinets. So uh, that brings us to the end of uh, the content here. Are there any questions that we uh, you have? Uh, if if you have any um, that you would like to ask, we'd ask you to type them into the chat now. So those could uh, pop up on my screen and I could start to answer some of those. Um, uh, and then I want to turn it over uh, while you're maybe chatting some of your questions to Todd for another announcement. Go ahead, Todd. Thank you, Lee. Um, very informative presentation. Really appreciate that. Um, one of the mission statements or, or the mission statement of the FSSA is to promote, educate, and grow the special hazard fire protection industry. And along with important informational webinars like this one that we've had today. We also have some great online training programs uh, as well as FSSA guides. They're both 
great resources to anybody that is in the special hazard industry. So I encourage you to go to the, the website, FSSA.net, to get some more information on both of those items. Um, Lee, I do have uh, two questions here I can throw at you, and we'll see if a couple more come in here. Um, one of the questions goes back to the links uh, that are either heat activated or smoke activated uh, for the, the curtains that create obstructions. Um, you had mentioned that the new standard requires them to be smoke activated. If we come across a heat activated curtain at this point, how do we handle that uh, as being involved in this industry? Is it something that we should replace or suggest to the owner to replace to a smoke activated curtain? Um, yes, uh, you know, I, it would definitely be uh, a recommendation that you should bring up to the data center owner. Um, uh, you know, many of these systems got installed with with feasible links. Uh, the uh, um, heat, heat only activated feasible links. Whenever we say feasible links, um, it's it's always going to be some heat component. And so the, what we see are two different styles installed. They're regular mechanical only uh, heat activated fusible links. And then there's uh, an electric thermal link out there. And so that is a uh, regular heat acted, activated link with a little chemical heater applied to it. And so that little chemical heater requires a bit of voltage to be applied to it when when that when that little bit of electricity goes through it then it starts a chemical chain reaction inside the heater it heats up and it will actually be the heat source to break the link and so in uh, applications where we have automatic obstruction removal where they've done it correctly those regular uh, fusible links will be replaced by uh, an electronic thermal link or ETL and then that there will be a power supply from the fire suppression control panel that sends that uh, a little bit of voltage to each one of those uh, upon smoke detection so it's a sequence inside the suppression control panel we get when we get smoke detection then we activate uh, a power supply which you know sends that voltage to those ETLs to get them to all break at once and drop, uh, drop the curtains or drop the containment system uh, uh, within the space. So when you go into a data center and you see existing just the regular um, fusible links and not the ETLs, then it needs to be a recommendation or you need to uh, do a little further assessment if, of, ha you know, are the sprinklers uh, adequate for this? You know, uh, do we have uh, obstruction problems with the sprinklers. Do we have a sprinkler inside of the contained volume? Um, and then is the, you know, have they already modified the suppression system? Uh, if there's a clean agent system present, is there a nozzle inside that contained space? Because if all that's right, then they don't have to get rid of those fusible links. Um, but if not, then they're not meeting the requirements of NFPA 75. And then we go through that that dance that sometimes we have trouble. Uh, we're not enforcers as uh, if we're looking at from an inspection, testing and maintenance perspective, uh, we're not enforcers. The best we can do is educate. And uh, if we see a major safety problem, uh, my personal opinion is then we we should, uh, you know, potentially, uh, you know, after educating, if they're really at risk, maybe we need to talk to the local fire marshal and educate them on the situation and get their help to to help them explain to the system owner that a change needs to be made so the system can operate properly sure yeah no certainly something a lot to uh to consider and, and to, to have that good conversation with the building owner uh, a couple more have come in i just want to throw at you one question came in with cold aisle containment what does detection look like on the hot air exhaust point of the cabinet? Okay, so if um, de detection at that point is, uh, since it's, well, air sampling to smoke detection is a great way to do that. And it can be a pipe ran either horizontally across the row of racks or, uh, or multiple 
pipes coming down in between every two racks vert vertically and then sampling ports drilled in those pipes, uh, those vertical pipes coming down the racks. That's where the detection can be done if we're detecting right at the hot leaving air face of um, of those units. And so there, you know, we, we didn't include that detail today, but there's other industry information out there that shows how to do that and pictures of that being done properly. Um, and so the one major advantage of doing that is if you have a dedicated detector for those, um, uh, for the hot out, hot facing side of those racks, then you could do a little better location or locating of where that smoke's coming from. Meaning it's probably uh, equipment from that pod that's having a, a thermal, can, you know, thermal overload condition and, and it's causing that smoke. So you can get to that, that um, rack faster, investigate and potentially shut that down before it breaks out into flames. Understood, okay. Um, another one that came in kind of on the same line was how does very early warning smoke detection enhance response in containment applications? Um, at, well, here, the, when smoke is, when a fire small, the thermal energy that's imparted to the smoke from the fire is not enough to overcome the HVAC air movement patterns. And so the smoke is going to move with the, um, with the, the aisle, you know, the air in the space. It's, it's not going to go up to the ceiling and collect at the ceiling where we would catch it with a normal, uh, normal spot smoke detector at the ceiling. So very early warning fire detection um, in the form of air sampling can be applied so that it's along the pathway of the air. So we can capture the smoke where it's going to be instead of um, uh, where we hope it would be at the ceiling. Understand that once you have aisle containment at play, we are now directionally routing the smoke along with the air. So that sometimes the only way to, to apply smoke detection along that path is with air sampling. Gotcha, okay. Um, any ideas as far as water mist used in data centers and how they would be impacted uh, if a data center is retrofitted with hot aisle, cold aisle containment? Is that similar to our regular sprinkler systems and clean agent, or is it something different to consider with water mist? Well, the, the answer is uh, sort of a yes and no answer. It depends uh, uh, on the installation. Some of the water mist systems that are being marketed to the data center environment um, I, I call them water mist sprinkler systems. So they're, uh, in essence, they're a intended replacement for a traditional uh, sprinkler system, but with water, you know, closed water mist heads up at the ceiling, and, and those closed heads have a thermal element in them that waits for the heat to get to them. And once, you know, once it gets hot enough at that water mist sprinkler, then it operates and sprays water mist into the space instead of, you um, uh, you know, instead of regular water with the larger droplets. So that it, it works a lot like a sprinkler system. So those obstructions, uh, water mist manufacturers that have that type of system have rules for obstructions and clearances from their heads. Um, while not contained in NFPA 13, they're in the manufacturer's literature and we need to follow those. And so that's, a, a, you know, much the same. There, There's a new variety of water mist system out there that uh, uses open heads uh, and floods the space uh, in certain areas just of the data center, just like uh, a total flood system would. And so those are total flood clean agent system would. Um, and so in that case, uh, I, I know honestly know less about that type of system. Um, the way it gets applied, uh, IL containment, we, you know, best engineering judgment would need to be used in that case. Um, I am, from what I do know of that second variety of system, IL containment is less of a concern because the um, the water mist nozzles are closer to the IT equipment um, in those in those cases. Okay. Back to detection. 
if detection principles are applied at areas where the hot aisle is leaving and again on the return grills before they go into the HVAC unit, is detection still required above the ceiling in the return air plenum? R read it one more time. Go, go through it one more time, Todd. If, sure. If detection principles are applied when air leaves hot aisles and again on return grills before going into the HVAC unit, is detection still required above the ceiling in the return air plenum? That, that's a good question, and that's probably a gray area inside of the, the newest NFPA 75 requirements. In my, um, in my interpretation of that, you know, as an engineer, I would say uh, that the detection at the return grills as the air comes into the, the crack unit or the, the air handler, that would suffice for the detection uh, up in the plenum. So that, that's my opinion, uh, my engineering opinion. Um, others may see it differently as we, you know, go out and have to have, uh, you know, our plans permitted and fire marshals look at it and other design professionals uh, evaluate it. Sure, okay. Um, for spot smoke detection, is it necessary to reduce the standard 900 square foot coverage for fire suppression protecting with clean agents? And if so, is there a recommended reduced coverage area for detection at the ceiling level and in subfloors? Um, so, well, with spot smoke detection, um, we typically follow that NFPA 72 table where it's adjusted for the air change rate. Um, but there's some additional information. Some of the manufacturers that uh, have design manuals for suppression systems, they recommend regardless of the air change rate, the, the detector spacing for a suppression system goes down to 250 square foot per detector. So instead of 900, um, so imagine you're protecting a space that isn't a data center that doesn't have that higher change rate that, uh, those detector, those system manufacturers still recommend a detector spacing of 250 square foot per detector, just in order for the system to be activated in time that we intend it to, to keep the fire small and extinguish the fire before it's done too much thermal damage to the um, uh, the compartment. Uh, for vi very early warning fire detection using air sampling, there's additional guidance, uh, which we did not talk about, that they recommend detector spacing at the ceiling of the sampling ports to be 200 square foot per detector. And they don't go to that, that uh, lower 125 square foot per detector uh, value that you find in that uh, NFPA 72 table. They just cap it off at 200 square foot per detector. Gotcha, thank you. And one last question, uh, and I think it's a, a good one. I, I mentioned earlier the FSSA guides that we offer, and, and we have a lot of great information that uh, I'll add as pulled together by the, the FSSA technical committee, which I know you're a part of, Lee. Um, a question came in is, has the FSSA technical committee discussed the potential of creating a design guide uh, for this information uh, so that there's one source to go with all the items that need to be considered? Well, if the question, uh, you know, speaking as an individual member of the, the, of the technical committee, but not for the technical committee, um, I, there hasn't been a discussion on aisle containment and data centers and having a specific guide, design guide for uh, suppression and detection and data centers. That, that's not been a consideration yet or at least it's not been a topic brought up at a meeting. Okay, well, may, maybe one to consider in the future. <laughs> you bet. So, so listen, um, we really, again, appreciate it so much, Lee, for your time and, and your knowledge. Um, you, you did a great job on the presentations. Hopefully everybody got their questions answered. If, if not, please reach out to us at the website, fssa.net, and if you have any 
additional information or questions that you have, again, reach out to us on the online training program or the uh, FSSA guides that we have out there. Um, with that, I'm going to pass it on to Becca for one final announcement. Thank you, Todd, and thank you, Lee. It was a great webinar. Um, thank you to all the attendees for joining us this afternoon on FSSA's webinar, Fire Protection for Hot and Cold Aisle Containment Systems in Data Centers. Just as a reminder, the presentation will be available on the FSSA website next week. Thank you again, and we look forward to having you with us on the next webinar.